So meanwhile, while we're waiting, let me introduce Douglas Elwin, not here for the first time, from the Smithsonian uh, National Museum of Natural History. Welcome. And he will speak about inferring ancestral functions for highly conserved um, developmental genes in early animals and their ancestors. Great. Thank <laughs> you. Okay, thank you. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here again. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dave for a, another wonderful meeting. Um, I'm a, I should begin by saying I'm a paleontologist, um, not a systems biologist or a, or a philosopher. Um, but one of the, what I'm going to talk about today is um, the work that we've been doing for a while, trying to understand the early origin and initial diversification of animals. Um, I come at this not as a developmental biologist, but rather as a paleontologist. Um, but one of the points that I want to make is that is understanding these issues requires synthesizing um, information from many different fields. Um, no single field really gives us um, enough insight into um, some of these processes. So. The interval of time that I'm going to primarily be interested in um, for the next half hour is between about 600 million years ago, 700 million years ago, and um, about 500 million years ago, when life was good. Um, and this encompasses an interval um, known to geologists as the Ediacaran, it's the last part of the Neoproterozoic, and then the Cambrian, and the Cambrian explosion, the origin of animals is something you may have heard of. And we have a number of beautifully preserved faunas um, that span this time period um, that I'll show you in a few moments, including the classic Brugge Shale that Steve Gould uh, wrote about in Wonderful Life. The questions that I'm primarily interested in here are the relative contributions of developmental potential, ecological opportunity, and environmental changes. So these large-scale evolutionary events in most cases through the history of life, involve um, trade-offs and, and interplay between ecology, development, or genetic changes, and environmental changes. And certainly, these events involve components of all three of these. And what I'll focus on today is really um, how we make inferences about um, the genetic or developmental changes and the role they may have played in this event. And what I want to do um, is focus on genes with deep ancestry, um, what are called um, deep homologies, so conserved, um, inferring conserved functions and, and how um, reliably we can do that, the evolution of the developmental con uh, toolkit, and then the context that we get from molecular clocks um, in the fossil record. Let me begin by addressing the fossil record. Um, a lot of people, including lots of biologists, um, remember that Darwin in Chapter 9 of The Origin of the Species talked about how awful the fossil record was. And that's why the fossil record didn't provide the support he expected it to for his ideas about natural selection. Um, in fact, the fossil record for many kinds of evolutionary and other questions is really um, a wonderful record of what's happened. It's not perfect by any means. It's based primarily on things that are durably skeletonized. Um, so they have hard parts that are geographically widespread and fairly abundant um, and marine, dominantly. But for that part of the record, we actually have an awfully good record. This is um, a chart from a paper in 2010 in Science by John Alroy and company um, from something called the Paleobiology Database for the last 600 million years, showing the number of genera with lots of up and ups and downs. The temporal resolution of this is about, uh, on average, about 10 million years. Um, and, uh, uh, I'm showing you this as much because it's a really cool result. And the paper is just coming out, and it's about 20 years of work. Um, uh, uh, so this is a paper that we have in press in science now. Um, it's dominantly done by my colleagues in Nanjing, who've developed a new database by um, basically putting the entire Chinese fossil record 
um, into a, a computer database and then using an algorithm that's based on simulated annealing so it um, lines up overlaps between um, conjunctions of species. Um, this is based on um, 11,326 temporal levels. So we have a mean resolution of 26,000 years. So instead of a mean resolution of, ten, of bins of 10 million years, um, using this new statistical approach with a much more robust database, we're able to get a temporal resolution of 26,000 years. That probably sounds um, implausible to some of you. But um, I'll also remind you that our um, this project began by doing high-resolution analysis of the, the rates of the end Permian mass extinction, which is right here at the end. And we can resolve time using high-resolution age dating. This was mostly um, done in the lab of my my late colleague Sam Bowring at MIT, who pro was probably the world's best geochronologist at, at this sort of thing. And we have the duration of this event down to plus or minus 31,000 years. Um, so for events that are 250 million years ago and beyond, we actually have a fairly remarkable temporal resolution. I'm sorry it wasn't done at Princeton. You guys didn't hire him. Yeah. Can, can, can you explain what are these vertically catched uh, bands? Oh, uh, so the blue bands are um, uh, glacial episodes. Um, so um, in the Cambrian, oh no, uh, they're diversifications. So there's a, the uh, Cambrian Ordovician diversification, um, one in the early Silurian, and then the tan bands are mass extinctions. Our losses of diversity. <laughs> so the end, end Ordovician, the late Devonian, and then the Permo Triassic. And the, so the causes of mass extinctions are what? I mean, are the origins known? Yeah, but that's a different talk. Okay. <laughs> so the, the durations of these are also known. So the duration of the End Ordovician is 5,000 years. Uh -huh. um, and uh, but I'll tell you about okay. the. For, for a little extra. Yeah, right. It's not the purpose of this talk, Stas. So let me tell you about what the fossil record looks like before the sudden appearance of animals. So if we look at rocks that are 850 to 750, 700 million years old, it's not that we don't have fossils. We have lots of fossils, mostly organic wild microfossils. Um, this is from a paper by Nick Butterfield in Current Biology in 2015 from his work and, and um, lots of others that work on this interval of time. Some of these include Teste de Mibi, I guess form here. So there, there are lots of fossils, but they're largely a few hundred microns in size um, and not dominantly solidified. Uh, starting 570 million years ago, we have what's called the Ediacaran biota, um, a series of fronds and other impressions. There's a little too much light here um, that you can see on the upper part of this diagram. Um, things like Dickinsonia um, and these frondlets here, as well as some skeletonized things that we have immediately below the base of the Cambrian. Then as we move into the Cambrian, oh, this is a, a reconstruction of what a, a Neoproterozoic seafloor might have looked like with this big Dickinsonia. Um, the only thing that we're confident is truly an animal and probably a bioterian is Kimberella, which is shown in the lower part of the slide um, there, which is probably a Lophotrochozoan and possibly a mollusk, um, although that's a little less, less clear. What the rest of these things are, we don't know. They don't have eyes, they don't have guts, they don't have appendages, they don't have a obvious brain. Um, but Dickinsonia, the large thing in the middle there, could be up to a meter or so long, although they're very they're very thin. Um, and of course, this has led to no end of speculation about what all these things are, um, which, which we all have great fun fighting about. Then in the, at the, the base of the Cambrian, everything changes. Um, and within the first few tens of millions of years, mostly between about 530 million years ago and 520, we have the appearance 
of all the major groups of animals. The, with one exception, the sole exception of the bryozoans, which are a colonial um, group of lepidrochozoans, which don't appear until the end of the Cambrian. Everything else, including fish, so vertebrates, chordates, mollusks, arthropods, lots of arthropods, and lots of other groups that um, are seemingly bizarre, appear as part of this assemblage. Um, the best animal in the history of life, in case you're ever quizzed about this, is Ophobinia, <laughs> right here, about that big, um, has, has five eyes and this what long it? proboscis. What is it? It's an early relative of arthropods. Oh. Not an arthropod, it belongs to the Panarthropoda, but it's getting towards an arthropod. So great animals. Um, these are some of the animals from the Chengjiang fauna, where I was about three weeks ago in Yunnan province in China. Um, so things that look like trilobites, some worms down below, and then a bunch of arthropods. Um, and there are also lots of vertebrates in this assemblage. And the diversity of these things, for example, within the arthropods allows us to identify um, the appearance of specific novelties leading up to the U-arthropod at the base of this figure from work by David Legg about 10 years ago. There are other things that happen as well. So there's changes in the, um, the sediment, um, which shows little evidence of burrowing um, in the Ediacaran faunas to the left. But then as soon as you get to the Cambrian, sediments become very well burrowed, indicating a lot of activity. Um, this is a recent diagram um, showing um, from the bottom upwards, the increase in the number of phyla from the Ediacaran and Cambrian, the number of classes in yellow, uh, the number of genera in green, showing a big pulse of diversification of appearances, and then trace fossils, which are these burrows um, in, the, in orange at the top of the figure. So it's spread out over a few tens of millions of years. It's not instantaneous, but it's a remarkably rapid appearance of essentially all major metazoan groups in the fossil record. And as Steve Gould pointed out in Wonderful Life, um, this is uh, one of the most profound increases in disparity, which is a measure of the morphological diversity, not simply the taxonomic diversity that we see in the fossil record. The environmental context of this is not something I'm going to focus on, but I need to mention that all of this happens in a world that's completely unlike the world of today. Um, most of early animal evolution happens in a world where oxygen levels were a tiny fraction of what they are now. Um, geologists traditionally measure this as uh, percent of PAL of present atmospheric levels, which are 21% O2. And this, the slide on the left there shows um, the multitude of estimates of oxygen levels um, over the last um, three and a half billion years. You'll see there are two big increases. The one in the middle of that diagram is called the Great Oxidation Event, um, and then another one toward the end. And there's a blog here from a paper by Eric Sperling at Stanford from about 800 to 500 or 400 million years ago, um, showing sort of boundaries on what these changes were. Um, the key thing to know is two things. One is there is a, a very substantial increase in oxygen levels during this, this interval from you know, below 1% to above 40% of, of present atmospheric levels. And secondly, that this was spatially and temporally heterogeneous. So that oxygen levels vary tremendously through time over this interval as well as through space that almost certainly had a significant impact on how organisms responded to this environment. So I've, I've told you what the... Where was it? There wasn't any. The oxygen we have now is produced by photosynthesis, but it only builds up in the atmosphere once you've locked up um, enough carbon to allow the, the, the other oxygen to to build up in the atmosphere and then in the oceans. So oxygen is, a, is, tall, is an entirely waste product, of course, but um, for largely geological reasons, there wasn't enough 
free oxygen around to build up in the atmosphere until um, no the GOE and... and well, there's some ozone layer, but, but certainly much less. Yeah. And which also means that sunsets had a different color. Um, so um, I've told you what the fossil record of this interval is. But that's not necessarily an unbiased record of the diversification, the divergences of many of these different groups. So another way we can look at that, and this is important for understanding the causality of developmental genes, is by using a molecular clock analysis. Um, we published one in 2011 in a science paper. Um, it turns out we underestimated the, the errors on, in that paper, which have been corrected. Um, in the paper in 2015. This is from a recent paper, again, by Eric Sperling at Stanford, that shows our data, and Eric was part of that paper in 2011, which is the, the yellow lines. Um, this is a timeline and then a, a phylogenetic tree um, for animals, and the various colored bars show estimates of when these particular divergences happened. And the, the critical take-home message for this is that all of these divergence estimates are tens to hundreds of millions of years prior to the appearance of these clades in the fossil record. So there's a, the, the, in other words, the early history of animals, the first 150 million years, 100 million years, is largely missing from the fossil record. Um, and there are a couple of solutions to that problem. It could be that molecular clocks are all wrong. Um, we now have fairly reasonable arguments why these estimates are probably not far off. They're not absolute correct, but they're, it's hard to bring the molecular clock analyses um, to mesh with the fossil record. Um, but the fact that we don't find any fossils during that 200 million years um, leads us to think hard about what, the, what animals were like during the early part of their attention to, are they uh, colored circles, which are calibration points um, against known fossil divergences. Um, so these are points where we have relative confidence that we know um, when those happen from the fossil record. And you'll notice that the estimates from the molecular clock and the estimates from the fossil record are fairly congruent, which is one of the things that gives us a lot of confidence in the, the molecular clock results. So if we're trying to understand this event, that, um, there are a whole series of questions. Why are these, these architectures apparently so stable? And what kind of changes to gene regulatory networks and other parts of the, of the regulatory genome were responsible for, for what we see? Um, there are a number of different scenarios that have been advanced in this, um, the early 1990s. Um, one of them is that um, each of these clades had an independent trajectory in the acquisition of appendages and eyes and things like that. That was the dominant view by Ernst Meyer and George Gaylord Simpson and most evolutionary biologists up to about 1990, that there's no similarity um, in the major attributes of the different animal clades. The discovery of deep homologies of highly conserved developmental genes um, essentially um, eliminated that first hypothesis as an explanation for what's going on. So the second hypothesis is that a lot of these key developmental genes, the developmental toolkit provided all of the developmental potential that we see. Um, another one is that, that there was a series of nested um, uh, novelties that occur throughout the early history of animals. Each of these different scenarios um, have different, make different claims about the causal relationships between changes in morphology and changes in development. So part of um, the job of developmental biologists and paleontologists and others interested in the early evolution of animals is understanding what these relationships are and trying to figure out ways of testing them, which for something that events that happened 600 million years ago is not easy, an easy thing to do. Many of you will 
know about the diversification, for example, of the Hox genes, which are responsible for anterior posterior differentiation in lots of bilaterian organisms. So if we look at modern organisms, you can look at the diversification of Hox genes and then make predictions about um, how those genes, um, what, what the complement of those genes would have been uh, hundreds of millions of years ago. And the extent of these homologies um, is even greater. This is from a 2004 review paper by um, Ball and others showing a mouse embryo and a Drosophila embryo and just a similarity in anterior, posterior, and dorsoventral patterning. These sort of um, discussions in the early 2000s led to this cartoon by Sean Carroll in his book DNA to Diversity with a hypothetical or bilaterian ancestor. Um, and this is, it's a wonderful organism. It's got eyes and um, a regionalized gut and a circulatory pump and segmentation. And because he didn't want to say appendages, um, Sean said, wrote in the cartoon, body wall outgrowth with distalis, which he used to call in talks, sticky outy bits. Um, this is a sophisticated animal. But the molecular clock results suggest that this animal existed 650 million years ago. And something this complicated, if it was benthic, would leave a trace in the fossil record if it's larger than half a centimeter or so. And we, we find no evidence of anything like this in 100 million years when these things would have been around according to molecular clock evidence. So either there's a substantial problem with molecular clocks or there's a problem with this reconstruction. And this reconstruction makes assumptions about the relationship between these genes and their function. It's assuming that a homologous gene is necessarily tied to the modern function. And that's what I want to question. Um, so beginning in 2002, Eric Davidson at Caltech and I um, wrote a series of papers in which we argued that, in fact, the, the function of these genes was for very different purposes in the early history of evolution. And that raises less conflict between the, the molecular clock data, the fossil record, and the developmental data. So in 2013, um, I this is actually from a, a talk that I gave at that time in which I argued that um, essentially all of the tools that you need to, to, um, for the development of animals were present by the origin of animals, say, 780 million years ago. If this is true, then the conclusion you reach is that animals originated 720 million years ago. The developmental toolkit was already present at the origin of animals. That's all you need developmentally. Therefore, the explanation for the later appearance of large macroscopic animals must lie either with ecology or the environment. Um, again, the, and that, does that make sense to everybody? Um, this is probably wrong. It's almost certainly wrong. Um, I've already, already raised the question about whether or not our inference about the function of these genes is correct. Um, but we there are other reasons for thinking that inference is wrong. And I want to, um, for the remainder of this talk, I'll just focus on um, one of these nodes, which is um, the last common protostome deuterostome ancestor, the Urbilaterian. There's actually fantastic work done on the earlier history of metazoans, particularly by Nicole King at Berkeley, looking at clanoflagellates, and then also um, Inaki Ruiz Trujillo in Barcelona, and Ari, Ani Sebi Pedros, who's been at the Weizmann and um, is now has started his own lab in Barcelona. And they've um, essentially established that many of these early clades, clanoflagellates, Philastrians and Anacthosaurians all have many of the developmental toolkits, tools that were once thought to belong to metazoans. But let me look in detail at this third bioterian ancestor, which is um, the node shown there. And on the left hand part of this um, slide, 
are shown four different interpretations of what that hypothetical ancestor might have been like. Um, the maximally complex one is the one I showed you earlier. Klaus Nielsen has long argued that instead of being a benthic um, animal, it was a trochaea. Uh, this is essentially Ernst Haeckel's argument from the late 19th century, um, which Klaus has been um, advocating for about the last 30 years. Um, another uh, less complex um, ancestor, similar to what Eric and I have argued for, is shown in the lower right there. More recently, Heather Marlowe has been looking in detail at the conservation of larval strategies across metazoans. And she's made, I think, a very convincing argument that um, the last common biotune ancestor had a biphasic lifestyle with both a larvae and an adult. Um, and that part of the complexity that we see in development is because there was a, already a complicated life cycle before the evolution uh, of animals had actually occurred. Um, this is a, a, a summary sketch of the appearance of novelties from the holozoa at the base, which is the entire clade, including animals and these other three um, cousins of metazoans, um, identifying many of the, the developmental or regulatory novelties that appear. There are certainly lots of important um, novelties that arise at the base of metazoa, um, including um, distal enhancers, which I'll mention in a moment. Um, but there are, um, well, let me, so one of the um, important discoveries in regulatory evolution in the last five years um, has been understanding more about chromatin architecture and how that influences regulation. Um, Chromatin is a three-dimensional architecture, and in bioterians, um, this architecture includes what are called topologically associated domains. These are areas of open chromatin in which regulation can occur, but these are um, largely confined to bioterians. And one of the reasons why um, we got the estimates of the early developmental toolkit wrong is that although the distal enhancers, these enhancers that are a long way away from the, the, the gene that they're actually regulating, those first occur in metazoans, it turns out that subsequent work has shown that they're not actually very widespread in sponges, nigerians, um, or placozoans. They're there, but they're not widely used until you get to bioterians. Once you get to bioterians, you have these transcriptionally active domains, you have the widespread use of distal enhancers um, and other regulatory elements, some of which are present at the origin of metazoans, but for some reason they're not widely used by these basal clades of, of sponges, placozoans, and nidurians. This led Eric and I um, to suggest that what happens um, close to the base of bioteria, or after the, the origin of bioteria, is the independent co-option of what were um, toolkits that were established for cellular differentiation, then become co-opted um, and um, diversified to control more sophisticated regional patterning formation. And that leads to eyes, appendages, guts, um, and the other things that, that characterize larger metazoans. Um, we all knew this was true of, bi of um, biomineralization. Nobody has confused biomineralization in mollusks with biomineralization in um, arthropods or, or skeletons and invertebrates. That biomineralization has clearly been independently co-opted in many different clades close to the base of the Cambrian. The argument that Eric and I began making over a decade ago is that the same thing is true of segmentation, um, the brain, sensory systems, appendages, regionalized gut, and other components. So those are, have been independently um, generated within bioterian clades. So that suggests that the early 
part of animal evolution um, involves the diversification of groups that have many different cell types, at least probably a dozen or so, up to Nidaria and Placozoans even, but not the sophisticated patterning um, formation that we see in later, um, in later bioterians. And this is just a, a sketch of that, that argument. But what this, um, to bring this back to the, the, the discussion about causation that's the, the focus of this meeting, this requires that this idea of widespread co-option of gene regulatory networks is a plausible argument. Um, is, that, is there any reason to think that is true? Um, there are essentially five different ways of repatterning gene regulatory networks. The introduction of transposons, modification of regulatory interactions, co-option of regulatory subcircuits, recombination, which turns out to be really important um, for adaptive evolution. There's been a couple of really nice papers in Heliconus in the last two months on this. And then the de novo origination of, of new regulatory sequences. Um, of these, the, the co-option of regulatory circuits is particularly important because it allows the hierarchical expansion of regulatory circuits in a way that isn't achieved by the other uh, mechanisms. And in fact, um, although we don't have a huge database of regulatory circuits yet, for the, the studies that have been done on animals, um, co-option turns out to be an incredibly important mechanism for regulatory, the generation of regulatory novelty. And we see that throughout the last 600 million years by, by comparative studies. So the sort of co-option that we're talking about um, at the base of animals is certainly plausible given what we know about the subsequent um, regulatory evolution of animals. And that leads to this kind of um, picture where um, the tools are present, um, but they're not widely used until we get up to bioterian animals, but that still um, tends to perhaps 100 million years before the appearance of bioterians in the fossil record. Um, and I'm going to skip the, through this stuff, which I thought I would do. Um, and I, I want to come back to this issue of chromatin structure. This is a, a cartoon from a paper in Nature Reviews Genetics in 2012 that um, shows a single gene with, the, with two of these distal enhancers, which become widespread in bioterians, um, as well as these insulator um, sequences that you can see in red in the upper portion, in the middle portion of the diagram. Um, all of these are largely confined or, or um, widespread in bioterians. And this, I think, raises some interesting questions about um, the, uh, the difference between the appearance and the use of developmental novelties, because this is another one of many examples that I've um, discovered of both gen gen genomic and morphological lags between the origin of things that, turn, that appear to be really good evolutionary ideas and their widespread use. Um, evolution is often thought of as being opportunistic, but it turns out often not to be uh, terribly opportunistic. Many of these novelties arise tens to hundreds of millions of years before they become widely used. And I think that's telling us something about um, the way evolutionary novelty operates. So this leads um, to a picture in which um, most regulation is proximal by a transcription factor, transcription factor combinatorics in the early evolution of animals or the, for the, the basal clades. Um, and it's not until um, we get to the bioterians that we have uh, the expansion of gene regulatory networks um, through intercalation of spatial and temporal regulation and extensive co-option independently in the deuterostomes, ectisozoans, and lophotrochozoans. And that's what I think we're seeing in the Cambrian explosion. Um, and I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fascinating. So we do have time for questions. And the coffee can wait a little while. So Doug, 
this is this is very interesting. I'm sorry that you didn't have a chance to go into more of those slides, but um, is the idea that you actually that when you have these differentiation associated <coughs> things as pre-existing, perhaps underutilized elements, um, that does that necessarily mean that individual cell types are distinct, or simply that cells have a bunch of different capabilities that they can use? under different signaling conditions? Um, that's a great question. So, and sickle cell transcriptomics is beginning to get the answer, and I skipped some of those slides. Um, so we, I mean, that's one of the ways that we actually will be able to sort this out. And the, the initial papers that have come out on single cell transcriptomics, which are mostly from Arne Sebi Pedris's group that were published in Cell, and then in Nature called Gene Evolution last year, um, have tried to um, identify whether there are, in fact, homologous cell types across these groups or just the diversification independently in different clades. The claim is that um, some of the cell types are, in fact, homologous across clades, but it raises a question about what the, whether the coenoflagellate is actually homologous to the collar cells and sponges. Yeah. But that depends upon the, the threshold that you use within the transcriptomes. So the, the difficulty in that approach is that it's, um, they're using the transcriptomes for the single cell transcriptomics, obviously. Um, but they're setting thresholds for the identification of homologous cell types. And that's a, a phonetic measurement rather than a phylogenetic measurement. So it doesn't exclude the possibility that there are cell types that are homologous that are below the threshold or that, that what seems to be the same cell type arose convergently. Yeah. So. Just, just, just to clarify, I mean, wh I think about stem cell differentiation, mm -hmm. and the big issue there is how reversible is it? Mm -hmm. uh, most people don't think that cells differentiate back to stem cells, but it's not clear why they can't. And right. a cell that differentiated back to a stem cell in out a different way, it would be the same cell type, but it would be deploying different sets of the toolkit, and and in a reversible yeah. way. Yeah. Right. I mean, well, part, so. Um, my my reading of the data so far is that some of these are some of the cell types are in fact homologous across these different groups and others aren't so the, the number of nerve cells within Nidarians is far beyond anything that was picked up by morphological data um, but I think I also think that there's still a lot to be worked out um, by both Detlev Arnott's group and some of the other groups looking at the evolution of cell types because I think a purely transcriptomic approach is missing some of the complexity of the origin of cell types. And we had addressed this in a, there was a big joint paper on the evolution of cell types that was published in Nature Reviews Genetics um, about three years ago um, in which um, and Detlev is the senior author but there are four different opinions that are embedded in the paper. <laughs> okay, next question. So you said that we might want to revise our view of evolution and not think of it as being opportunistic anymore, so what's your... Oh, I, I think lots of evolution is opportunistic, but I, I think um, there are certainly components of evolution that are clearly... So in the, the model of novelty and innovation that I've been... Um, working on for the last several years, I identify a phase of potentiation in which involves a gener the generation of capacities that are not um, widely used. And those are responsible for a phenomenon that has been identified for the past couple of decades by paleontologists called macroevolutionary lags, which is the origin of, cl of um, groups that have um, particular capacities that, aren't, that don't have an ecological impact. Um, angiosperms actually turn out to be an example. A flowering plants would seem to be a, a great idea. Um, flowering plants diversify in the Lake Cretaceous, but if you do a, a census analysis of floras in the Lake Cretaceous, as my colleague Scott Wing has done, um, so you have a volcanic ash bed that, that covers the flora, so you can actually do ecological censusing 
um, so you can look at the um, abundance of different groups. By diversity, um, it looks like the flora is dominated by angiosperms. Once you look at the ecological abundance, you realize that there are angiosperms present, but if you were looking at the flora, you wouldn't know they were there. The flora is still dominated by, by non-angiosperm taxa until after the, the KT mass extinction. So um, the same is true of, of insects. Um, there were lots of other examples of either novelties or the establishment of, of clades that have very little ecological impact for tens to hundreds of millions of years. Um, one of my favorite example is actually a group of uh, bivalves called the lucinid bivalves, which were chemosynthetic. Um, and they arose in the Silurian 400 plus million years ago. Um, and they're present up until the Miocene. Um, but once mangrove swamps evolved in the late Miocene, it's like, hey, <laughs> um, and they go crazy. And they start diversifying, and they're found in mangrove swamps all over the world. So um, they, were, they persist for 400 million years without ever having much ecological impact on, a, on an ecosystem. That would be consistent with being opportunistic because they're just yeah. it's awaiting the, the right occasion to right. Okay. evolve. Yeah. yeah. But but the but the potential the the potential arises long before the diversification of the clade, which is not what it's the opposite of what Simpson claims. Can I just ask can I just ask you a different question? You you talk about reuse of <coughs> Of genes, you've talked about a, a neutral evolution event that might precede the use of genes, but you haven't told us about gene numbers. Oh, uh, it, sure. It, 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 what is the importance of increasing the potential? I mean, bacteria have a smaller genome than metazoans. So, how important was gene numbers, or, or if you like, what? that toolkit of something that, that selection can operate on? How important was that? Um, it, uh, Reasonably small, because um, as you probably know better than I do, um, there is certainly a substantial increase in gene numbers from holozoans, from coanoflagellates, to metazoans. It, it about doubles when you go from coanoflagellates to, to Drosophila and, and other things. But if you look at the gene numbers for um, sponges, placozoans, nematocella, um, Drosophila, once you get to 15 to 18,000 genes, you can make anything you want. So a gene number isn't the, the issue. It's less than a two-fold increase in gene number that allows you to get metazoans. Um, and I'm not, um, it, it, it's possible to make an argument that gene number played almost no role in the initial origin of metazoans. It's, a, it's really about the regulatory interactions. And the, what you do see is a, a huge expansion in transcription factor families um, and things like that. But that's a very small component of the of total gene number. I'm not totally surprised at your answer because in the, the plant field, I think they now think that polyploidy arose many times. Yes, it's also yeah. relatively unimportant. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a great way of making corn. But um, it's, uh, for overall um, evolution of plants, it's not. Um, there was, of course, I mean, there are a couple of, of whole genome duplications um, at the base of vertebrates. Now, whether or not those were causally related to the diversification of, of vertebrates is not, it's something that's highly contentious, but. Thank you. A, a short question, I mean, we talked about it. I mean, first of all, it was fascinating. Thank you for that talk. Um, are there any people who conduct experiments on uh, the co-option of gene regulator network? Oh, in extant species, I mean. Oh, and trying to um, actually generate co-option? I can't. There, there are certainly lots of people who document co-option, whether it's Neil Schubin stuff looking at the origin of skates and rays or looking at the Glassford group has done these wonderful studies looking at co-option in dr the Drosophila melanogaster clade. Um, but those are all comparative studies. I don't know of anybody who's done experimental work on that. Positive, yeah, I mean, that was what Eric and I were working on a grant about when 
he died. <laughs> we talked about it four days before he died. That was a proposal we were going to send to NASA to do that sort of thing, but it didn't happen. Evolution. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for the session. You're all invited for coffee and tea.